We might have had to take a car trip to every single place and knock on doors and hand out leaflets. But now we can do that without necessarily, um, without having to go through these channels of approval. We can just take a good idea and make it happen. You might think that kids with our famously low attention spans wouldn't enjoy hearing talks about serious issues like education and the environment. Before TEDx Redmond, I was worried that nobody would really want to come. I was thinking maybe we'll get like 50 or 60 people. So I set the threshold at 100, I would raise it, but uh, I eventually raised to 500 in case um, there were more people. I didn't want to deal with the wait list. So the two nights before the event, I checked the ticketing service and my heart about dropped and rose at the same time because I saw that 500 out of 500 tickets had been uh, collected, they were free, and I later had to raise it to 750. We had 750 people sign up to attend and over 750 people attend. It taught me something else that I mentioned earlier in my speech. <coughs> Instead of creating content based on your assumptions of an audience, I could have said, no, this is an audience that isn't going to go for educational talks. I'm going to get Justin Bieber to come instead. <laughs> if I had done that, we wouldn't have had to have We would have had this amazing youth dialogue about important issues. So instead of creating content based on your assumptions about an audience, try to create content that you yourself would enjoy watching. You might have noticed that the best kids' books are the ones that you find yourself kind of reading to, to the end to, under the pretense of reading the small children, of course. And I really wanted to have the same attitude about TEDx Redmond. I'm going to make a serious conference that I would want to go to. And as it turned out, there were a lot of other kids who wanted to attend a conference made up of their peers and role models. And I think that while not all of you might be starting a conference or you know, making a program for TV, for instance, this really applies to online, to uh, technology, to products, whatever you make, and however it involves us, even if it doesn't involve youth, when you're making something for an audience of adults, you want to keep that in mind. And if you think, well, this is just something a bunch of overachieving teenagers do in their spare time. This is like a weird little uh, difference in this population. I'm sure regular eight-year-olds will be able to do it. TEDx Kids at Sunderland should be eye-opening. Uh, Thorny Post Primary School in Sunderland, England, gave the TEDx Kids format to a bunch of eight-year-olds. And uh, it was, as the website put it, not a bunch of adults to talk about what kids need, but a bunch of real, live, unpredictable, unfettered kids. While it's a little bit, uh, a little bit sad for me to see my under-18 record shattered by eight-year-olds, mm -hmm. it's also really uh, heartwarming, and I'm like, bring it on. Because the younger that we can get talking about important issues and understanding the problems in the world, and I'm not talking about like really showing graphic videos to seven-year-olds or anything, but uh, the earlier that we can start this discourse and have a serious conversation, the earlier we can start solving problems. And at this first TEDx conference for the under 10 age group, the third and fourth graders were involved in the nitty gritty details. They were calling up sponsors, they were asking for uh, the license, applying for the license, they were calling up to book the venue. And I mean, imagine being the person managing the venue. Hi, my name is so and so. <laughs> calling from TEDx Kids Sunderland. Like I mentioned with the examples of the technologically in touch toddlers, these kids have an unfair advantage called going through childhood in the 21st century. I'm telling you to rethink how you reach out to my generation, but you really need to watch out for these kids. So how do you reach out to persnickety people like me? I don't like being talked down to with you know, all kinds of weird advertising gimmicks or superficial plots. I don't like to watch long, boring ads. Uh, and so you might think, well, what are we supposed to do to promote a product or um, make something engaging for this kind of audience? We make content interactive and cause-based. Has anyone here heard of the term cause marketing? See some raised hands, okay. Well, uh, the, the panel I was at yesterday about the black hole of Facebook moving beyond light kind of touched on this, emphasizing the importance of engaging with your audience, potential customers, beyond just getting people to hit like on your Facebook page. And interacting with your audience in a meaningful way is something that can be applied to content creation, how you learn online, and how you work with social media. Just as we don't want to limit the quality of content based on our assumptions about a demographic, we don't have to start out with low expectations and limit audience participation to uh, likes on a page or comments. You can harness the participatory energy of your audience, whether young or old, to do great things for the world. And so many companies have been expanding on this. You see companies that are trying to you know, do sustainable coffee, and I'll be talking about that, but um, I want to quickly switch tack here. I know that going from great things for the world to the Vancouver riots is a bit 
bad of a transition. But did anyone here watch the game on TV or anywhere? I didn't see some raised hands, but I have a lot of fans here. Well, you probably also heard about the aftermath, which makes it sound like a natural disaster. But I don't know about you, I live about three hours from BC. I live near Seattle, so we drive up to Vancouver sometimes. And these are not the images I usually think of. My hypothesis is that Canadians have spent way too much time being better than Americans in certain aspects and just had to let it out. <laughs> yeah, but some much needed redemption for Vancouver came in the form of social media. Did any of you see this event, uh, Post Riot Cleanup Let's Help Vancouver on Facebook? Yeah. I see some raised hands. We well, also be proud to see that 20,644 <laughs> people signed up to attend and that was just when I took the snapshot earlier this afternoon. And today, the upstanding citizens of Vancouver were busy at work showing you what the real people of Vancouver look like. You see how simple tools, we don't have to go and build something or be really complicated with technology here, we're just using existing tools like Facebook to do great things. Uh, in the case of my sister getting donations to the Indian school or Vancouver uh, citizens going out and helping their city. The perfect union between content creation and marketing and my generation that doesn't talk down, that doesn't force us to sit through long, boring ads, I think can come through something like this. Solving social issues with engaging multi-platform outreach. When I was last in Toronto, I uh, got to be on the CBC's George Strombolopoulos tonight, and on the show I discussed the United Nations World Food Program's Free Rice Initiative, which is uh, basically for each answer you get right on various questions around different things, you donate 10 grains of rice to the World Food Program to help end hunger. You don't have to pay anything, it's all through sponsors. And on his show, George Strombolopoulos asked viewers to join his free rice group, and he also posted alerts on Twitter. His group has now raised over 6 million grains of rice for the hungry, and instead of treating Twitter as a competitor for attention spans, instead of saying, I have a TV show, I'm not going to use social networking, uh, George Strombolopoulos used Twitter to raise awareness about a good cause and maintain a presence in the audience's lives outside of the time they see him on TV. So you see how something that we've been talking about, you know, nobody watches television anymore, it's going downhill. People who are uh, working through mediums that might not seem popular anymore are maintaining popularity by out reaching out on many different levels, not just on TV, but also on, Twitter, on Facebook through causes. Fittingly, since Pepsi has a presence at North by Northeast, uh, I've been impressed with what Pepsi has been able to do with the Refresh Project. Has anyone heard of Pepsi, the Refresh Project? I'm seeing some raised hands. Well, um, by the way, I'm not being paid by Pepsi. I would love to be paid by Pepsi, but I'm not being paid by Pepsi. <laughs> Even though I just said their name three times. <laughs> Giving grants to good ideas in areas like education, community, and the arts, Pepsi supports all these programs uh, with, uh, well, with financial aid, with the publicity from the website. And I know they'll swear it was out of the goodness of their heart, and I'm sure I believe them. But you also have to agree that cause marketing, or supporting causes with your brand behind it, is pretty good marketing. It's caught on from Starbucks trying to sell sustainable coffee. You'll probably see that they're always talking about like, you know, this came from Ghana, or this came from South America, or saying where it's from, and it's sustainable. Uh, Tom Shoes from what's a buy one, give one shoe program. There are all these examples of cause marketing, and a lot of people have also been involved in social entrepreneurship, where they actually start the company and sell the goods with the sheer purpose of trying to do good. But for those uh, profit-based businesses, I don't mind advertising if we can make the world a better place in the process. And that's what I see happening on a bigger and bigger level. Cause marketing has gone really more mainstream now if you see with the environmental products and things that are sustainable. And as far as getting a positive image for your brand, I'll say this. It sure beats, oops. Um, I was going down the image, actually I'm grateful I don't. It sure beats Abercrombie and Fitch's naked torsos on the back. I don't know how anyone thought that was a good image. Ultimately, it just isn't the world of children should be seen and not heard anymore. That's very Victorian, and yet it's the attitude that I see a lot of companies having. Whether it's television programming that doesn't reflect real uh, teenage culture and ideas, or if it's clothing that's overly expensive and not produced in a sustainable way, or even um, like drink companies that aren't doing a project to give out to the community, um, we really are a big section of who consumes content, we watch videos, we buy clothing, um, and tune into programming. And we're not just media consumers, we're creators. A bunch of the YouTube comedians that I showed were in their 20s or even their teens. With new technologies in the form of social media and mobile advancement, we're making our voices heard on a multitude of channels. 
you'll go to websites and they'll be highlighting youth who have started charities, who have been involved in sports, who are doing nonprofit and business work. If there's one thing you walk away with, I hope it's this, that my peers and me were more than rolled eyes, hoodies, and earphones. With the internet, our phones and our tablets, we're actively customizing our viewing experience, creating and sharing content, learning online, starting movements, and speaking up. The ways that you reach out to us show what you think of my generation. And it's the way we respond that shows what we think of you. Thank you.